being able to provide people with carbon offsets when they in fact reduce their footprint and that becomes a tangible financial reward for doing so, I think could it potentially change how billions of people live their lives. When you talk about the market for digital assets, it's very uneven. Some will grow, some will decline, but overall, this is going up. Um, that's the direction because this is the biggest digitization of assets uh, in the history uh, of the world. recession is more severe than the global financial crisis. We are looking at other available options. More and more people are buying and holding Bitcoin. 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 Let's take a look at Bitcoin. Some call this digital gold. Everybody should probably have 1% of their assets in Bitcoin. We're extremely, extremely lucky to have not only Don Tapscott, but his son, Alex Tapscott, both co-authoring an amazing book called Blockchain Revolution and another really interesting book that just came out recently, which is called Financial Services Revolution. We are super, super lucky as some of the most credible sources have actually named Don and Alex to be the top 50 business thinkers alive and often called futurists. And the reason why you want to hear these gentlemen say on what's happening as of today and the future is because they actually can visualize it. So hope you enjoy every single moment. Uh, just to kick off, I want to share a quick story to you two gentlemen. I was in Davos during the World Economic Forum. It was minus 17 degrees outside and a friend of ours brought us to a piano bar. And when I entered the piano bar, I was like, wow, I see Norel Rubini on my left. Ray Dalio was in a corner at the end of the bar. And then all of a sudden I bump into Don and I'm like, whoa, Don, great to see you here. And so we started talking and all of a sudden there was a piano player who said, Don, we're looking for you. What are you doing? And all of a sudden Don gave me his smartphone. He said, can you hold this for me just one second? Went all the way over there, rocked a harmonica, started playing the harmonica, jumped on the piano, started singing. And we had just an amazing, amazing night. And the interesting part, Alex, is that on that smartphone, he also had a very cute picture of his granddaughters. Alex, do you play music as well, or is it just your dad? <laughs> I do, yeah. Um, my, my wife is really the musician on our side of the family. She's actually a, an accomplished jazz musician. Um, but I play some piano, and I also play the ukulele, which is an instrument, actually, that I, I've really just picked up in the last couple of months um, as sort of a, a quarantine hobby. And it's, um, it's a bit easier than the guitar to learn. Um, it's only got four strings and uh, it makes a beautiful sound. So I've been playing that a couple hours every day while I've been kind of locked down here, and it's been, it's been very nice. Very cool, very cool. Hopefully one day we can uh, see you guys play together. That'd be absolutely awesome. So without further ado, let's jump into today's theme, which is the pandemic, the global recession, potential depression, and how will blockchain, crypto, and Bitcoin react in these tough times? So first question is for you, Don. And as we know recently, you wrote a really interesting article which was featured on Coindesk. And this article was called Five Ways Blockchain Can Help With This Crisis. So if you don't mind kicking off with a big macro picture, really appreciate it. Well, sure, I'll start off on this and then maybe Alex can mention the five ways. But um, at the Blockchain Research Institute, when the, um, you know, the virus, the pandemic hit, we had to, um, to pivot in a couple of ways. One was to make sure we have a fully digital business model. 
but the other <clears throat> is to um, ensure that we're, we remain relevant in blockchain as the second era of the internet, the internet of value, um, is relevant to anything that's going on. It turns out it's dead relevant to a pandemic. So what we did is we pulled together a round table of about 35 people, experts, in blockchain and public health, and uh, or in various parts of that, and supply chain, which is the other big one too. And um, we had a big conversation, and then we launched, based on that, a research project, and we published um, a report, um, which uh, uh, Alex can tell you about, but the report is 25,000 words. It's a very significant document. And Alex and I are the co-authors, and we also co-authored the article in Coindesk uh, as well. The report has received many thousands of downloads, and we're very excited about it. We, Unlike our usual reports, which are proprietary to our members, we made this one public uh, to the world. But um, this pandemic is a terrible situation, obviously. The the economic costs are are staggering, and I don't think we understand those yet. And the human costs are unfathomable, unfathomable. So, um, what if we had an internet of value that could help us better understand health data while protecting privacy of citizens, and that could better help us manage a crisis like this? Everything from supply chains to getting um, um, uh, medical supplies to uh, frontline practitioners to um, uh, preventing shortages in the market for consumers. So um, this report is now available uh, public and, and it's free. Alex, do you want to say a few things about the five theme themes? Um, yeah, so the, the report is really the, the result of the many years of, of research that we've done at the Blockchain Research Institute looking at how blockchain is going to change every aspect of the economy, society, government, and our institutions. It was also informed by a, a major roundtable discussion that we organized right as things uh, were really heating up with this crisis. Uh, we brought together 40 industry-leading experts on blockchain, public policy uh, experts, uh, people from within government, as well as uh, entrepreneurs and technologists. And from there, we came up with five, uh, sort of a, a rubric for thinking about this. And um, those five different themes, which we called a framework for action, uh, were self-sovereign identity and uh, shared data, uh, just-in-time supply chain solutions, um, what we call sustaining the economy, which is really about how we can rethink money and financial assets during this time of, of crisis when there's uh, problems with liquidity and problems with people getting access to money, um, creating a rapid response registry for the workforce, figuring out how to get qualified people into hospitals and, and uh, environments where urgent care is really required. And um, thinking about creating incentive models for change. So this is something that applies to this crisis, but also when thinking about the future, how do we encourage people and incentivize them to change their behavior um, so as to improve their health or to potentially limit the, the spread of the virus in the future. And uh, as Don said, it's a 25,000 word report and uh, it's available for everyone. And we strongly encourage people to check it out. I think there's uh, something for, for everybody in this report, whether or not you're um, in government, you're a policymaker, if you're an entrepreneur trying to think and anticipate how the world is going to change structurally after this crisis is over and what kinds of businesses you can build um, to adapt to the future, whether or not you're an existing business leader and you want to understand how you can deploy this technology today in your business, um, especially excuse me, if you're in financial services or in logistics and supply chain, um, if you're a hospital administrator or if you're um, a frontline worker. There's all sorts of um, insights in this report, which um, which I think are are going to be you know impactful, and, and they already have been. Um, quite honestly, you know, we we started a webinar series on the bit on the back of this uh, report, and uh, so far we've had um, thousands of people sign up, and um, the response has been quite uh, interesting and quite gratifying for us. Yeah, it's so impressive that not everyone can actually access the webinar. I know you guys were full. You had full capacity even before going live. And it's really admirable that you guys are gathering so many people from different angles, different perspectives, different ways of seeing this whole pandemic to really give uh, every single angle. I would love to ask you, Don, based on this, is perhaps to focus on health and self-sovereign identity, 
before we go into wealth, economics, and financial markets. Could you tell us a little bit about why you think health data, self-sovereign identity could change the picture radically? Well, a big problem with the pandemic, maybe the biggest problem is just lack of data. Um, and data is the most important asset really in fighting pandemics. Without data, uh, we can't answer all these critical questions like who's infected, uh, where have they traveled, um, um, if there's any useful data now, it, it sits in institutional silos, it's inaccessible uh, to people, and a lot of data just isn't there. So we need better access to the entire, uh, to data of entire populations. And, um, and we need speedy mechanisms for consent-based uh, uh, data sharing. Now, the problem here is that there's a perceived conflict between providing healthcare data on the one hand and uh, undermining privacy on the other. But this trade-off between privacy and public safety uh, need not be so stark. And um, the, the solution to this is really that our health data should be part of our, of our self-sovereign digital identity that we own. Uh, right now, the virtual Alex knows more about you than you do because um, you don't know where you were a year ago or what medication you took or what you spent or what you said or what you got on a test or uh, what diagnosis you had. Um, and I mean, hundreds and hundreds of classes of data that constitutes our, our digital identity. The trouble is this virtual Alex is created by you. It's not owned by you. So what if you owned your healthcare data and from, you know, uh, real-time devices it's capturing stuff like your heart rate maybe even your your temperature it's got your location and so on this is in your identity but we negotiate as part of that that during a crisis summary data or maybe even you'll agree to have your personal data shared with certain clinicians or authorities so that if you have the virus you agree that you're going to behave well you're not going to go out in the community spreading it and you're prepared to share data showing that that's true so we can have our cake and, and uh, eat it too around privacy and this is uh, kind of a really exciting idea and of course this is part of a much broader thing called a self-sovereign uh, patient uh, and, and citizen identity that we capture uh, all of our all of our data. That's one of the big themes of the work that we're doing. Definitely a big theme, and you know, a lot of people say that self sovereign identity or digital ID on the blockchain is one of the most mm -hmm. useful applications that we could see in the in the near future. I know, Alex, that you've also covered supply chains and how the pandemic has affected supply chains, and using supply chains also as a use case for this particular crisis. Do you mind telling us a little bit more about the supply chain side of things? Yeah, well, it's quite obvious that the crisis has put a significant strain on supply chains and we're concerned that they may not be able to get access to uh, essential goods to weather the, the crisis that we're in. Um, and that's a, a problem uh, based largely on uh, a lack of transparency in supply chains. The concept of a supply chain itself is actually a bit of a, a misnomer. Um, when we're thinking about supply chains, we're not actually thinking about each individual supplier or entity in a supply chain. What we want to think about is the asset itself. So um, our thinking is that blockchain can enable not just supply chains, but what we call asset chains, where you have a shared ledger that every key participant in a supply chain can see and access, which shows the state of that supply chain at any point in time. And this is an important application, if you will, of blockchain, not just as a digital medium for value, a way to move assets, uh, financial assets and currencies and so forth and, and identities around, uh, but also as a way to take a, a snapshot, a trusted snapshot of the state of a complex system at any moment in time. And so it's critical that we adopt this technology um, so that we have a much clearer picture. And the, the outcome and the consequence of that is, is quite significant. Um, every year, uh, supply chains move about $50 trillion worth of goods uh, around the world. Um, it's a linchpin, really, to our entire global economic system. And according to some estimates, upwards of you know, 50 basis points, so half of a percent, um, of goods that are 
you know, purchased and sold and moved through a supply chain are actually counterfeit or fraudulent, which translates into hundreds of billions of dollars. And uh, during a crisis, that becomes exacerbated because we're moving very quickly to address key problems like, say, the lack of um, PPE or ventilators or other medical equipment and trying to understand the provenance and the authenticity of assets that are moving through the supply chain is a huge challenge. Now, blockchain is not um, a silver bullet. It's not a panacea that can address every single issue. Um, but right now, we have this system, which is highly fragmented, this uh, just-in-time supply chain, which uh, is under severe strain. And we have an opportunity to rethink how that might work. And then the, the, the consequence for the consumer is also very significant. You know, what we've seen, it's become an internet meme, this, this uh, notion of people rushing to get toilet paper. Um, there's no shortage of toilet paper in the supply chain, but people are, are afraid that they may run out of it for whatever reason, because I think there's a lack of clarity and a lack of trust um, that these supply chains are robust. So um, for not only the entities who are benefiting as conduits and as end, user, as, um, you know, end uh, buyers or, or the suppliers themselves, we're also thinking about the consumers. So there's opportunities here to, to fix this, to reduce fraud, to improve efficiencies, to improve trust and confidence in the system. That's a really good point because there were cases already where ventilators were missing at ports, people stealing it for their own sake, a lack of transparency, a lack of trust. And this really, it makes so much sense because as you guys were saying, the health data through a self-sovereign identity and then being able to track the goods that can preserve our health all really makes a lot of sense. So if you don't mind, uh, gentlemen, if we can move towards the going from health to wealth. Uh, and I would love to ask you guys questions related to uh, one of your recent books. Alex, congratulations for uh, publishing Financial Services Revolution. Uh, how would you explain gaining financial power in today's blockchain era and, and especially in terms of this crisis as of today? Yeah, well, the thesis, of, so uh, let me talk, talk about the book for a moment. So the book is the first book in a new series that we are releasing to the public. And the thesis of the book basically is that capital, as we know it, is being reinvented. Now, capital historically has been, you know, narrowly defined as money and financial assets. Uh, but what blockchain enables is the first digital medium for value is an expansion of the concept of capital. So it's not it's now possible to uh, digitize and monetize virtually every asset in the economy. And that's gonna have a very profound impact on the world. Um, you know, this uh, unstoppable force of blockchain is on a collision course with the immovable object of financial services. And the collision is going to be very profound. And it's our belief that within a decade, uh, the, the world as we know it, um, as it relates to assets and markets is going to look virtually unrecognizable. And one of the key spaces that this is having a huge impact is in money itself. So what we're seeing right now is the emergence of three new categories of, of money, basically. You know, money historically has been, uh, you know, physical, rare, precious metals, um, which can be used as a unit of account and store of value. Later, it became things that were the exclusive right of, of governments, central banks to issue. And now we're seeing these three new kinds. So those kinds are First and foremost, uh, grassroots, organic, um, self-organized currencies like Bitcoin, which have grown to be worth hundreds of billions of dollars, are used by tens of millions of people and have been a reliable store of value and unit of exchange and, and um, uh, unit of account for some time. And because of the success of Bitcoin, we're starting to see the two other big stakeholders in the economy uh, wake up to this. And those, of course, are large corporations, specifically large technology conglomerates or large social media companies, so you see Libra, um, which is the initiative launched by Facebook. And then you're also seeing governments themselves who recognize that um, if they lose the power to create money, the exclusive rights to create money, that their um, influence uh, over the economy uh, will be diminished. And so they're waking up to this opportunity as well. And so that's where you see the rise of what are called central bank digital currencies. Um, the leading opponent right now being the Chinese who have actually just rolled this out in a number of different cities in China. Um, the benefits of a central bank digital currency are, are many fold. Um, number one, um, you're able to see with much greater clarity how money is being spent in the economy. And so you have, um, I think, more effective monetary policy tools um, to administer. Um, it reduces friction in the economy and helps potentially solve the problem of the unbanked. 
And it also uh, would allow government to react more responsibly during a crisis. So for example, what you're seeing in the United States today is that policy has been enacted and uh, enabling people to receive a, an amount of money from the government to hold them over through the crisis. But many aren't receiving it for weeks or even months because of the antiquated and archaic systems that are in place. So um, a central bank digital currency would allow every citizen in an economy um, to have access to basically a bank account with the central bank, which would allow them to access that money instantaneously. Now, there are drawbacks uh, to all of this. I think there are a lot of positives, but there are also drawbacks to this. And uh, that's being, I think, highlighted during this, this current crisis, which is that because cash, as we understand it, physical dollars um, have been known to be a, a way to transmit a virus. I mean, if you think about it, they're changing hands between people. And as a result, um, you know, pathogens can spread. People are saying we should eliminate it. Well, that may be where we're going, but we can't um, consider eliminating cash until we have a digital alternative. And a digital cash is um, very different than Visa or MasterCard or debit. It is a, a digital bearer instrument that allows individuals to transact in a private way. And all other options today, at least, don't have the same privacy features that cash does. And if we're going to eliminate cash, then we need to design systems that preserve many of its finest attributes. And that's something that I think is ongoing today and is going to be accelerated by this current crisis. So the book, um, which came out before the coronavirus, um, you know, ravaged uh, the economy and, and, um, and humanity, interestingly touches on a lot of these ideas and I think anticipated a lot of them. And since the crisis began, we've, we've obviously been expanding on that and tried to understand how um, this uh, crisis might act as an accelerant. And that's all in the report that I referenced earlier. Sustaining the economy is a huge section on what does the future of money look like? And um, I think it's going to be very different. That's fantastic. I'm so glad you transitioned to CBDCs because I have to give you huge credit, Don, because you're the first person I found online who predicted the RMB to actually become digitized. We're not going to be using Bitcoin in China. The Chinese people will use the RMB. Only the RMB will become a crypto currency. It'll, it, it, it will, the central bank of China will turn it into a digital uh, currency. So before we jump into that, I would love to ask you, Don, number one, what was your favorite part of financial services revolution? Were there any breakthroughs or uh, epiphanies that you had while reading your, your son's work? But also, could you let us uh, know about, is this renminbi or Chinese Yuan digitized version a threat to the US dollar? Or how do you think things, how do you see things go from this point onwards? Um, well, first of all, there's the book. And um, it's a gorgeous book. And today I will announce the sister book is out. Um, oh, wow. So we're, we're publishing a new book every quarter uh, at the BRI. And so this one's edited by Alex on financial services, and this one is on supply chain, and it's edited by me. And these are uh, millions of dollars of research that are now available for like 25 bucks. And uh, I got both of these up here at my place on the lake, uh, delivered by Amazon, so you can actually get them on Amazon right now. Uh, financial services revolution, the opening very significant essay by Alex, like several chapters, um, is, uh, I don't know, it's a tour de force. Anyone I know who's read that, it's like the top of your head blows off. When you think about it, these are the biggest changes to not just the financial industry, but to money in, in many decades and arguably hundreds of years. And uh, most people don't have a clue how big this is, but it's a very big thing. It's not a theory. It's all uh, playing out right now. And of course, if uh, if China were able to establish its DCEP, uh, its digital currency, um, throughout uh, not just China, but into Southeast Asia, along One Belt, One Road, into Europe, down into Africa, where China's got massive business interests, that would replace the US dollar as the currency of record. Uh, and so the, the Fed and, and uh, leaders in the United States are scrambling to figure out what's the next step. And weirdly, one of the long-term effects of this whole um, terrible situation that we're in with blockchain is that um, it may in fact... Um, with coronavirus. Uh, sorry, what did I say? Yeah, with yeah. The coronavirus, is that it may in fact um, 
accelerate our movements towards a whole bunch of new uh, exciting innovations. Fantastic. And if I can stick with you, Don, there's something that you're really good at understanding is how these industries are going to affect our behavior uh, and look at the more psychological, the social side of things. And then, of course, Alex, if you don't mind weighing in as well, that'd be uh, great. But Don, I know this is something that you can see very clearly, if you don't mind elaborating on that. Yeah, I think that there are a lot of different ways that this crisis is going to change uh, our behavior. I mean, obviously, we're all kind of getting used to working at home, and that's going to um, that's going to be a, a big um, change in society. We've got um, uh, changes in terms of travel. I think that there won't be a lot of business travel uh, for some time, even even when things clear up, if and when. And even if there's a, a vaccine, I think there's sort of a PTSD, honestly, that a lot of people um, are going to be suffering from. There are, um, you know, anybody planning a cruise, um, the, the planning on going to a movie in a movie theater, um, these kinds of changes. We're learning certain behaviors, and I think that these changes will continue. There will also be big changes in our institutions and the way that we think about them. You remember the old Margaret Thatcher, Ronald Reagan, the best government is no government, or, uh, you know, the best thing governments can do is get out of the way. Well, now uh, it's a tough time to be a libertarian because we understand that societies need to have ways of cooperating together to solve problems and that there is a real goal uh, for, go for governments in protecting the rights of, of the individual by enabling a society to act uh, collectively. Those are some of the changes. I wrote a big uh, article about this, permanent changes coming about. Uh, it was published in the Toronto Star, if anyone wants to Google that. Yeah, and there were really interesting parts. You talked about getting serious about universal basic income, the virtual workplace, yeah. acting global. That yeah. was a fa fantastic article. Yeah, you know, you know, think global, act local. Well, now we understand that acting local is acting globally. I mean, you know, when one person gets a virus somewhere in the world, then uh, three months later, the global economy shut down. So um, we're all connected um, in this world, and we all need to take, to not just think about our own interests locally, but our interests are connected to the interests of the rest of the world. It's my hope that maybe this will stimulate some action around climate change, for example, as it's a very similar kind of thing. Thank you so much, Don. And since we're talking about the future of things and events, Alex, I would love to ask you about Bitcoin, cryptocurrency, money, financial services. Obviously, it's very difficult to predict the future, but I guess your book is very well timed as these events might accelerate what you're, you're advocating in your book. Um, can you just give us a few angles on how you see the future playing on a more of a wealth perspective? Yeah, sure. So the first thing is that I think a lot of um, asset classes are about to go through a, a very significant transformation or, or migration um, from an analog medium to a digital medium. And uh, one of the biggest asset classes in the world are um, equities, stocks. Uh, you know, stocks are basically contracts. They entitle the, the bearer of that instrument to um, you know, a share of a common enterprise, uh, access to cash flow if that company pays a dividend, the ability to vote on certain um, governance matters and so forth. Um, anything that is a paper-based contract is going to become a, a native digital asset. And so you're talking about the transformation of um, tens of uh, trillions of dollars of assets to this new platform technology, and that's going to be very significant. Um, in the book, we made a prediction. We called it um, The World in 2030, and it anticipated what money might look like. Now, that was written before the crisis. I think we probably need to revise it to the year in 2025, because um, like so many things, this crisis is acting as an accelerant for a lot of the changes which were already underway. And I think what we'll see is those three different categories of money that I described uh, being self-organized grassroots cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin, corporate currencies, or corporate mediums of exchange like Libra, and central bank digital currencies being more or less ubiquitous, widespread, and used by everybody. But how they're used and by whom um, is going to be a very interesting 
situation. So you can imagine, for example, in many parts of the world, like in Africa or South Asia, um, Facebook's Libra or some other equivalent could be issued by Alipay or Tencent or Amazon or what have you, um, being more widely used than the local fiat currency. Um, and in fact, our research um, has demonstrated that there are um, hundred, potentially hundreds of millions of people in the world who have access to uh, Facebook, but do, don't have access to a bank account. And so a you know, durable digital corporate currency that holds its value and is widely used and accepted um, could become the bank account of choice for a lot of people who live in uh, the global south. And that will have a destabilizing effect on the governments that issue the local currency because all of a sudden that currency is just simply not as useful and is not as widely used. So you can see that geopolitical potential ramifications of that and also the corporate ramifications, which is governments boycotting companies because uh, not, they're not only having an impact on the social lives of people in the country, they're actually uh, changing the economic behavior and having a huge impact on government too. Um, that's one of you know a few different things that we anticipate. You know, um, the predictions are you know not <laughs> are a funny thing, right? We 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 say the future is not something to be predicted; it's something to be achieved, and that's why at the BRI we're working closely with many of these companies and governments to help manage the transformation. And that is the goal of the BRI in 2020 and beyond. Um, but having said that, um, you know, when we're looking towards the future, we do have to think about how the world is going to change. So. Those are some of the things that we see uh, happening um, in the next few years. Very well put, Alex. And if you don't mind me asking a similar question, you know, there's a lot of criticism, support for Bitcoin. It's really mixed emotions these days. Uh, according to Brian Armstrong from Coinbase, a lot of people are using their fiscal stimulus to buy Bitcoin. Some people are saying that Bitcoin is no longer a safe haven, is no longer non-correlated, it's correlated to the Dow Jones. There's a lot of criticism on whether Bitcoin is one of the solutions for the future as, you know, the new form of money or the internet of money. Uh, what's your angle on this, Don? And are you seeing this crisis as something that it's more positive or negative to Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies? So during the liquidity crisis, which is what we went through in March, um, everybody's looking to sell everything uh, in order to move to whatever the most liquid form of money uh, or asset is in the world. And that happens to be the US dollar. So for a period of time, um, Bitcoin acted like all other risk assets, uh, risk assets being stocks, um, you know, venture capital investments, um, even bonds, corporate bonds, junk bonds, and so forth. Everyone was looking for an opportunity to sell. And so Bitcoin was no exception. Um, but over the longer term, um, it, the correlation between Bitcoin and, and, you know, other risk assets is, um, is tenuous at best. And if you, if you look at the crisis in March, during that liquidity crunch, even gold itself, which is considered to be, you know, the store of value during a crisis, suffered because everything was for sale. Having said that, Bitcoin today is still uh, early stage in the sense that, you know, it isn't widely used um, by hundreds of millions of people the way the U.S. dollar is, for example. Um, and so as a result, um, during a crisis, it can have that impact. But if you look at it today, you know, it has recovered. Um, it's re remained uh, to be pretty durable in terms of price. And um, as it matures, I think you'll see it act less and less like a risk asset and more and more um, like a store of value. That makes a lot of sense. And, and Don, obviously, you've, you've commented in the past related to uh, economies and you've explained the, the financial crisis. I know, Alex, you had a really good TEDx talk, which talks about Wall Street. Is that correct? Well, something like that. Basically, the 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 thesis of the TED Talk, which informed by all the work we've done, was that um, you know Wall Street is um, the next big target for technology, and that's because we have this new uh, digital medium for value, and that's what Wall Street traffics in our assets, financial assets specifically. And um, if you have a new way of organizing capital, of fundraising um, for companies, of exchanging value in a way that's peer to peer then of course it's going to have a very big impact on the intermediaries who historically acted as um, the go-between and captured a lot of, uh, of the value of that. Awesome, yeah, we'll definitely put a link uh, there below. Um, and Don, so in terms of the economy, financial markets, as you know, financial market cycles 
are ahead of economic cycles. But this current crisis is very different from the 2007 to 2009 great financial crisis. Could you share your thoughts on this? So uh, when it comes to crypto, I think that Alex described it well. The, the, there are these three classes of currencies, the community-based currencies like Bitcoin, the corporate currencies like Libra, and the, the state-based uh, state fiat currencies like the China's DCEP. And um, I think there's a role for all of those. And for sure, uh, the Bitcoin's not going to go away. There are all kinds of applications for Bitcoin that are, cannot be addressed well by the other types of currencies. And the other thing to remember is the crypto market, the market for digital assets, is not just about currencies. Currencies is one type of a whole bunch. Tokens can represent all kinds of things. You can have tokens that, that are there to perform some kind of um, utility in, in, a, in an application. Uh, so Gollum wants to get you to put your PC on the, on the network so they can create a cloud. They need a way of incenting you to do that. There are platform tokens. Like to me, and, and us, Ether is not really a currency. It's more a token that enables functionality like smart contracts, enables applications uh, to work. There are natural asset tokens. Alex, you know that I'm involved in something called CarbonX.ca, where we're tokenizing carbon uh, credits. And the goal is to change the behavior of, of uh, billions of people. There are um, there are other natural asset uh, tokens that could t uh, refer to something like a barrel of oil. That'd be an interesting price right now. Um, or you could have uh, tokens that represent uh, a collectible, like a, a crypto kitty, or for that matter, could represent any kind of thing that people collect. So there are many different types uh, of tokens. And so when you talk about the market for digital assets, it's very uneven kind of thing, like some will grow, some will decline, but overall, this is going up. Um, that's the direction, because this is the biggest digitization of assets uh, in the history uh, of the world. So when we look at, you know, interesting uh, tokens to invest in, and again, I don't give investment advice to anybody, um, you know, you've got Bitcoin, um, Ethereum on the platform side, and then there are all kinds of these new, very interesting type platforms. Cosmos for is, one, uh, the, is one that's of interest to us. The internet of blockchains and solving the problem of scalability and interoperability in one um, uh, sweep. So um, for sure, all these people say this is all over and it's all going to decline. I think that's that's just myopic that we're we're at the second strike of the first batter in the first inning on this game we have a long way to go that's so beautifully put in it leads me to one of the final questions um alex obviously you know for those who had invested in the fang stocks during the last crisis they would have made significant gains and as don says probably asset classes or different sub asset classes may emerge in this token economy do you, Alex, believe that Don's example of CarbonX, so a token that encourages ethical behavior, is one of the great use cases that we'll see in terms of the evolution of tokens? I do. I, I think that um, we have the ability now to create financial incentives to augment behavior, where previously that didn't exist. So if, as an individual, um, you know, the fact that you reduced your carbon footprint or you know, acted ethically wasn't rewarded other than for in your own sort of sense of, of self-satisfaction and self-worth. Uh, but now we have the ability to create actual monetary incentives. So, um, you know, being able to provide people with carbon offsets when they in fact reduce their footprint and that becomes a tangible financial reward for doing so, I think that it potentially change how billions of people live their lives. Um, now, it's interesting, your, co your comparison to the FANG stocks during the last crisis. Yeah, I mean, um, you know, 20, not 2009, 2010, the period afterwards was sort of the beginning of the acceleration of our, our digital lives. Um, now, what, what the FANG stocks were able to do was to benefit from the centralization of data, um, data being, you know, the most important asset class 
of this economy. People say data is the new oil. We've never actually subscribed to that. And for good reason today, since oil has got negative value, we've always said that data is more like industrial plant yeah. equipment. It's actually like a tool that you can uh, use to create things that have value. You can't do that with oil. Oil just runs the system. Um, data is something more equivalent to you know, a complex machine that you can augment in order to build something that has value. Um, so the question now this time around is, um, will we see the FANG stocks continue to concentrate their wealth and power in the economy, or will you see the emergence of decentralized systems? And I actually think at this point in time, um, the jury is, is still out as to whether or not one will be the winner. I think both actually can occur. I think with the FANG stocks, um, they will probably emerge from this more powerful than they were in the past. I mean, just look at Am uh, Amazon, for example. Um, Amazon today basically is the economy in the United States. It's the way in which people buy essential goods, access services, entertain themselves, and so on and so forth. Um, so it's unlikely this, that, that the Amazon is going to end up weaker as a result of this crisis. If anything, they'll be stronger. Um, but at the same time, we're seeing um, this uh, emergence of um, you know, a new consciousness regarding how our data is used, um, whether it's being used appropriately, and quite clearly it's not. And as a result, I think you'll see the emergence of decentralized uh, systems that uh, challenge the hegemony of these large technology conglomerates and, and big technology companies. Um, and that'll be another defining characteristic of the next sort of uh, five to 10 years. You know, the, the 2020s are gonna be roaring indeed for reasons that maybe we didn't anticipate um, as the, these systems um, come uh, up against each other in this sort of grand global struggle. You, having you two is just, I'm still mind, uh, it's, it's mind blowing for me, two geniuses and, and uh, it's just, you, you really complement each other so, so well. Uh, one thing that I really want to stress guys, you, you've heard right now, Alex was talking, Don and Alex were talking about how tokens that incentivize ethical behavior, or positive behavior is something that could extremely, that could go really well in the near future. Actually, uh, Don and Alex, there's an example here in the UK, it's called the sweat coin which basically use an app and the more you work out, the more sweat coins you receive. And then the sweat coins can give you benefits to buying, for example, uh, protein milkshakes and other supplements to help you get them at discounted rates to promote healthy behavior. So as you said, I think there are multiple use cases of those ethical or positive behavior tokens that are surfacing. And one, sorry, just one last question and then I'll, uh, I would love to hear more about Blockchain Research Institute. Um, we had Rand Junior uh, from CNBC Crypto Trader on the show last week, and he was talking about tokens that would basically give you ownership in a product rather than equity. So, you know, when you buy equity, you have ownership within a company. He was talking about how it'd be more interesting to have ownership within a product. So if you, if McDonald's has a new drink, every time a drink is being poured into that cup, you get a small dividend from what is being poured. If you think the, the next Nikes, the near, next Air Jordans, are super cool they're going to sell well you can buy that token and then you'll get dividends from sales H have you heard of any of these type of use cases or is it something that you think could work really well in the future sure alex yeah. um, well I, I can answer that yeah um yeah i mean that's what don referred to earlier um, as sort of a utility token um in in the sense that um rather than owning equity you get um access to use a, a certain network right um, and you get access to the product so the more um, widely used that network of product is the more valuable the tokens that you have become. Um, and it's a very interesting concept that can apply to a number of different kinds of um, business use cases. You know, Don mentioned um, there are a couple of, of projects that are trying to aggregate uh, computing power on people's PCs and, and laptops and so forth into sort of a global cloud. And, um, you know, if you put your device into this uh, global cloud commons, then uh, you might earn tokens. And the more valuable that network becomes, i.e. the more people and companies use it, then um, the more uh, your stake in that network increases. Um, I do think that that is an interesting use case. I also think that its applicability to many different businesses is slightly overstated. And I actually think that um, for a lot of projects that funded themselves in 2017, 2018, when they were selling a token that was supposed to have utility, what they really actually should have done was to um, figure out a way to sell um, equity in their business because that's really what people were trying to uh, get exposure to was if this business is successful, um, can I benefit financially from it? A lot of them were not end users per se, they were speculators. Now, 
you know, of course, easier said than done. At the time, and still today, frankly, the regulatory regime is woefully um, uh, un unprepared to deal with these new kinds of um, finan financings that are basically decentralized global crowdfunding campaigns, which is a shame because uh, they represent uh, a potential boon to entrepreneurs. And we need entrepreneurship now more than ever, especially with this crisis, uh, with jobs lost and a lot of uh, legacy businesses shutting down. We need to make it easy for smart people to stand up a business, get access to capital, and to build value. And uh, if we do this right, it could potentially lead to the, the halcyon days of entrepreneurship, right? Where uh, any entrepreneur, regardless of where you are in the world, uh, you don't have to be in Silicon Valley or New York or Tel Aviv or rural Ontario in Canada. Um, you can raise capital, launch a business, employ people who are working from home all around the world and build uh, software and build uh, companies that have value. Uh, but we need to get that regulatory part figured out so that um, companies who want to do utility token offerings can, when appropriate, but those who really don't need to um, can issue equity quickly to build their business. That regulatory clarity is something that it will be definitely key in the years to come. Hopefully in North America, we'll have more clarity on that. And uh, just before ending, I would love to ask you, Don, t uh, about the Blockchain Research Institute. If you could share us some information and how have you guys pivoted in this crisis? Because a lot of companies are struggling. And Alex, if you, if you don't mind commenting on that as well, telling us a little more about Blockchain Research Institute and how we can get involved, that would be amazing. Well, the main uh, pivot that we had to make operationally was for one of our four businesses. So we disyndicated research. And as you can see, the focus there is uh, these days is on public health, pandemic, supply chain, digital currencies, um, uh, uh, incentive systems for getting people to do the right things, all the kinds of things that are pertinent to the topic today. Alex described it well in one of our management meetings um, a month ago. He said, look at guys, this is the second world war. People don't want to hear about um, uh, boating opportunities. They want to hear about the second world war and they want solutions for the second world war. So uh, we've done that. Our, um, our, the one business that we've had to pivot on is our online or our events business. Uh, we have our big enterprise event and it was supposed to be in April uh, of this year. And um, we've delayed it to the uh, last week of October. It's called Blockchain Revolution Global and it's going to be a hybrid event. It'll look more like a, uh, a TV show with a studio audience and a beautiful sort of television um, uh, high production value stage. And um, um, we're also using hologram technology now. We've partnered with a company called Art Media, uh, A-R-H-T uh, Media. That's the leader in holograms. Um, we've The other two businesses are doing great. The, uh, the book publishing business, yay. Uh, two new books out, Financial Services Revolution and Supply Chain Revolution. Um, and uh, we have one coming out called The C-Suite Revolution every quarter a new book. And the business that's really on fuego right now is our uh, online education business uh, through Coursera. So we now own the big um, blockchain in the enterprise set of, of courses. In total, now there are eight of them. Um, they're already in two languages and they'll be in multiple languages soon, including Chinese. And these are the big courses. And um, the, the enrollments have, I don't know, quintupled uh, in the last month. As uh, everybody's sitting at home, they're looking for things to do. And it turns out we've got something to do. These are beautiful courses, 150, um, actually 250 videos, um, 250 exams and quizzes. Um, they cost us close to a million dollars to produce, and we're very proud of them. Uh, that's blockchain in the enterprise through Coursera. And our partner there is INSEAD, the business school outside of Paris. We'll definitely put all the links below, Don, for those who want to get more information on this course. Yeah. Please do click on the links, have a look. And there are tons of really valuable content Coursera that Don has produced in the past, which can really inform you. And, and as everyone knows, the blockchain industry will offer many jobs in the future. So this is really worth, you know, during these difficult times, learning and, and being able to prepare where, when things take off. Alex, any other words of wisdom you'd like to add to that related to Blockchain Research Institute or anything you would like to share? 
um, we've been thinking about a transition actually long before this crisis occurred. Um, you know, recognizing all the changes that this crisis is accelerating, uh, we actually transitioned to this virtual model um, in the fall of last year. And so, um, you know, you never want to say there's good timing for a crisis like this. Of course not. But um, it's it has allowed us to um, to uh, to take advantage of the fact that a lot of people are at home and to still continue to be impactful and to to make a difference. Um, because we've built these online tools that really anybody um, can access. So thank you very much for um, suggesting that people check it out. Um, you know, the course is one of the highest ranked on Coursera. Um, it's, as Don said, we're seeing enrollment um, quintupling now during this uh, period of time. And uh, you're absolutely right. You know, this is a technology that isn't just for one industry. This isn't just for financial services professionals or for people who work in logistics. Um, this is the second era of the internet, and it's going to have uh, a profound impo impact on every industry. So regardless of who you are, where you work, if you want to understand the future and prepare yourself professionally for that, um, you should 100% take this course. Yeah, your TEDx talks are definitely, if they can just look at those extracts and see how well you guys are at, at, at educating people, I mean, it's, it's really easy to understand the value. Uh, but thank you so much, Don and Alex, for your time. It was wonderful getting in touch. We hope to have you in the future at the production set. Hopefully it doesn't have to be remote next time if you're in London. And uh, wish you the best of the best to you and your families and, and the loved ones. Okay, thanks so much. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, guys.